Welcome everyone to this CyberSight webinar, uh, our first digital grand round based in the Bristol Eye Hospital. And we'd like to thank Orbis and CyberSight for giving us the opportunity to present uh, some interesting cases to a global audience today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to the Corneal team at the Bristol Eye Hospital. And Omar is going to present a number of interesting Corneal cases. We'd like to thank our patients for giving up their time to come to us. There will be a live feed directly from the slit lamp, uh, an opportunity to, uh, for us to pose you questions for some of the cases. We hope you enjoy the next 60 minutes. Omar, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Omar. I'm one of the corneal consultants here at Bristol Eye Hospital, uh, and I'm just going to get right to it. So uh, we have our lovely patient here. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Uh, <laughs> All so right, thank you. Do you want to put your chin on here, maybe? I'm just going to try and show the signs here. So you've had cataract surgery with us four yes, weeks four ago, weeks. isn't it? Yeah. Okay, and that was done by one of our registrars here in the yeah, hospital. The yes, and it was an uneventful cataract surgery, yeah. wasn't it? Good. So uh, in terms of how the eye feels, everything feels okay, no problem? No problem, no pain. Uh, but you're still not seeing improvement in your vision, is that no, right? Okay. No, Can you try and look? Okay. Can you try and look straight ahead for me? Is that showing okay? Yeah, that's good. So this is your right eye. This is the eye that we did not operate on. Glad you've done that one, yeah. Good. So big white eyes for me. Next. Yeah. Big white eyes as much as you can. Okay. Right. Looking straight ahead here, just there. Good job. Right, so these are the signs that we have. Just describe them to us so far, what you can see. Uh, yeah, of course. So uh, essentially, we're now looking at the cornea. You can clearly see that she has moderate to severe uh, postoperative corneal edema. Uh, her pupil is nice and round. You can see the uh, IOL there is stable. I know that um, she had a bit of zonular dehiscence and the capsular tension ring had to be put in uh, during the surgery. Uh, so what we can see here is residual persistent corneal edema four weeks uh, down the line after cataract surgery. And uh, I guess the question is, um, what to do now? Do you want to take a seat? Look at the endothelium on the, on the right. Uh, yeah, let's try and do that. No, that, that's fine. So big white eyes, we're just going to see the endothelium here on the right side. Actually, that has... An interesting sign as well, if you want to tell me what you can see. Can you see that on the endothelium in this line? Again, if you just describe what you can So see. what you can see here on the endothelium, there is uh, a beaten bronze appearance on the endothelium of this eye. So she does have endothelial gotata and underlying Fuchs dystrophy. Um, that might explain uh, the situation with the left eye after the surgery, which has led to the cornea not really clearing up. Um, what we would typically do uh, in this case on the left eye is we would continue to manage conservatively with topical steroid drops and topical um, sodium chloride drops to try and clear the edema. And we typically give it up to three months to um, resolve. Uh, if not, then we might be, uh, we might consider having to do a corneal transplant edema. All right. That's it. Fine. Yeah. Lean back. Yeah. So if you were doing, when it comes to the surgery on her right eye. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Uh, so, yeah, of course, um, for the right eye, we need to first do a, a corneal pachymetry and an endothelial specular count to see if uh, the specular count and the corneal thickness would be okay for us to just proceed with cataract only in the right eye. Uh, if it is, uh, then we can do cataract with soft shell, uh, trying to uh, put... Um, uh, um, uh, Well, doing cataract with the soft shell technique uh, to try and, and conserve whatever endothelial cells we can. 
if we think it's a high risk, then we can offer uh, a combined fecal DMAC from the start. Yeah. yeah. Can you just maybe tell us, do you mind, sorry, no. what, what medication are you taking at the moment? Um, so I think it's dexamethasone, 0.1%. Uh, yeah. That one. Yeah, it's dexamethasone 1%. She's using it four times a day. I think it would be a good idea for us to also add um, concentrated salt solutions to 5% sodium chloride. That would also be helpful in managing her corneal edema. Um, and we give it time to clear. And if it doesn't, then we offer her uh, uh, an endothelial transplant. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sort you out with some new medicine today. Right. So which will hopefully start to clear up your cornea. So Lovely. you had your cataract surgery done. You can see your lens is sitting there really nicely. Good. And it's now what, what we can see is some clouding there at the front of the eye. Yeah. Which is causing some of that bother you're on the steroids, which is great. And what we've just said is we're going to give you a new medication to help with that drying up, that swelling on the front. Right, okay. lovely, yes. All right. Yeah. Have you got any questions at all? Um, no, I mean, it all sounds very, you know, a corneal transplant. We're not there yet. We no. have to give the eye a chance. Is that to like kind all. of the same thing again? Similar process from your point of view, but uh, uh, the recovery is a bit different. Um, uh, and uh, the management protocol in terms of the eye drops and, and things is different. Yeah. But as I said, we're not there yet. We have to no. give it time to no. clear. And if it doesn't, then we can offer you something else. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I'll give you your drops again. Thank you. No worries. Um, so this is our uh, second patient that I, I wanted to show today. So he's a 51 year old gentleman. Uh, he has an uh, underlying diagnosis of uh, atopy and atopic keratoconjunctivitis, um, and he suffered with it uh, for, for many, many years. And uh, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and show some signs here. We'll start first with his left eye. Um, to be my eyes. I'm just going to try and help you open your eyes. So as you can see, there's a lot of light sensitivity. Big white eyes. He has his contact lens on. And if we look here onto the cornea, underneath the contact lens, you'll notice that he has some uh, superficial corneal scarring. Uh, this is due to uh, him having also keratoconus which we know is a common association with severe atrophy uh, because of the eye rubbing. Now I'm going to show the situation in the right eye. The right eyes again, I'm going to try and open your eye here as much as possible. There's a lot of light sensitivity. Can you look down for me? That's really good. So I'm not sure if you can see here, but Raj has had a surgery only yesterday. And this is the appearance of his eye on day one after the surgery. You can try and look down for me, please. That's really good. So what you can see here is a full thickness transplant, um, as well as a DSEC underneath the full thickness transplant um, with about a 40% filled anterior chamber with air. Um, the reason why we had to do this is, you can sit back, Raj. Uh, is because he has had a full thickness corneal transplant after developing corneal high drops. That was about uh, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, of course, with the significant inflammation of the ocular surface and the atrophy, uh, we had to use systemic immunosuppression because it was deemed to be a high-risk corneal transplant. Uh, and he's done quite well for a number of years. And his vision was 6-9 uh, corrected with glasses with his, uh, uh, with his uh, PK. Uh, up until last year, where unfortunately he had a rejection episode and uh, the transplant ended up failing and um, he developed significant edema and his vision was hand, hand movement. Uh, so the options then was to either redo another full thickness transplant in the midst of uh, the significant anterior surface or ocular surface inflammation, uh, which would have necessitated again the use of systemic immunosuppressive medications for uh, at least two years. Um, and then manage the stitches and uh, the new refractive uh, state of the eye. Or the other option would be uh, to only try and replace the endothelium 
Uh, and uh, we ended up doing that by doing a DSEC on the back of his PK. So that's where he is. Uh, in terms of the management of eye drops, now he's just going to be on uh, topical treatment with antibiotics and intensive uh, uh, steroid eye drops. And we typically see him in week one. Hopefully, uh, if the DSEC is attached then, then it will continue to be attached and um, we'll get back to the 6 9 vision. Well, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I actually Raj had his surgery under general anesthetics. So what was the experience for you? Um, so the first DSEC was general anesthetic. Yeah. That was okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mind the drowsiness and thing afterwards. That's okay. Um, after they realized the uh, endothelium didn't stick, mm -hmm. um, I had to quickly go in for um, uh, to try and unscroll or unravel. Oh, yes. Sorry, Raj. Yes. I'm just going to... Uh, uh, so essentially what happened is, uh, I, I forgot to mention that bit, is we, we initially tried to do a DMAC for the failed 2K, and we did that about four weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, in week, in week one, the DMAC did not completely stick, and then we tried to do a rebubble, and that's what uh, you were describing yes. there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, go on. So um, when the DMAC didn't stick, um, yes. it sort of rolled and scrolled itself up and scrunched yes. up. Yeah. Um, so uh, Lee, one of the surgeons here, said, we'll get you in next morning quickly yeah. and we'll try and get under it and roll it out and fix it. Um, he had a good attempt at it. He said it was difficult because of the foggy surface. Yeah. Um, he kept putting his dye in or something, which says helps him to see. Uh, but then apparently the endothelium clears it away very quickly <laughs> as well, because um, that's its job to clear away fluids and things. Um, so he had a challenge doing that. Um, we bubbled it with air, I think, but it didn't work. Yeah. Um, that procedure was done under local yeah. anesthetic, and I didn't yeah. like it. <laughs> Fair enough. Very uncomfortable. Um, yeah. So they go in with all the numbing drops and things, it's okay. But then I think you feel the needle when it goes in, that deep sort of injection or Sorry fluid. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. feel like your eyes are going to explode. <laughs> okay. um, but, you, you know, so, but you get over the anxiety and you start to settle down after a while. Um, I mean, you, it's kind of interesting as they talk about what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the interesting part of it. But pain-wise, it's not great. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the last one yesterday? Last one was okay, perfectly good general anesthetic. Yeah, it put you to sleep. Uh, I, I was okay afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much for Thank giving us you your time. Thank Straight you. after your operation. Uh, so, right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that back on. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let me introduce. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm slightly off screen, but that's okay. Hello. So my name is Dimitri Manassas. I'm one of the glaucoma consultants here at Bristol Eye Hospital. So this is Piper, who is 19. She um, went for an eye test last year, um, which was her first eye test in several years because of COVID, and was found at no, didn't you? Yeah. But you, but you weren't really aware of any eye problems, and you thought you were getting migraines because you needed glasses to focus or something on his lines, um, and was found to have pressures of around 45 in both eyes, incidentally. So she was sent straight to the eye emergency department here, um, and was started on some drops, um, and shortly afterwards, um, went, we went ahead with surgery in one eye and then in the other eye, and so I'm just going to show you the signs around that. Okay. Well, if you sit yourself forwards on that, we might take that a bit higher for you. Yeah. Let me put my glasses on, just try and get it in focus for everyone else. Yeah. Okay. Now and look down for me. And then we're going to have a look at the other line. And look down for me again. And a bit down into your left, if you would. Okay. 
I will look at the back of the room quickly. I'll try to turn that brightness down a bit. That's shining at me. It's tricky to do this on this machine, but I'll do my best. No, all right. There we go. Go on. Okay, brilliant. Mm -hmm. There we go. Have a rest back for me. Thank you very much. And, uh, Lawrence, if you have the first questions for uh, case one, please, for the audience. see what people observe as they But most think it's a limbal based trabeculectomy on the left and a preservable low micro shunt on the right. So we'll pass you over to Dimitri just to tell us what was actually done. Uh, well, it's, it, well, I suppose it depends what you refer to as a limbal based or a fornix based. Um, Typically, when you're talking about that, you're talking about the conjunctival flap, not, not the scleral flap, because scleral flaps are always limbal based. But conjunctival flaps these days are mostly fornix based and were traditional, well, years ago were more uh, also often uh, limbal based. So this is actually a fornix based trabeculectomy because of the, um, the incision is at the limbus, which means the base of the conjunctival flap is in the, the fornix. Uh, but you're right that there's a pressure flow in the other eye. So um, actually, so Piper is someone who um, has juvenile open angle glaucoma. And so because the glaucoma is relatively significant and the pressure didn't come down enough with surgery, we knew that we wanted to do surgery. But there is evidence now to suggest that um, because the majority of outflow resistance in, in all glaucoma, really, but in particularly in juvenile open angle glaucoma, is at the, um, the level of the trabecular meshwork, that doing trabecular meshwork opening procedures, such as trabeculotomy, can uh, mean that you then don't have to do trabeculectomy or, or subconjunctinal dr uh, drainage surgery in so many people. So at the time, we weren't yet doing um, ab interno trabeculotomy here. We're now, we are now doing the omni system here. Um, so um, we did ask whether uh, at another center, whether they were interested in doing that. But the feeling was that the best thing to do was to go for the most effective operation um, because of more significant glaucoma. And because there was, was more visual field loss in the left eye, we went straight for the trabeculectomy in the left eye. If we ask the question now, Lawrence, question two, uh, about drainage surgery in younger patients uh, and why there's a risk of excessive drainage. So if we pop that question off and then we'll let Dimitri carry on with the discussion.
So it says single choice, but actually, uh, my fault in writing the questions, one or all of these may be correct. Not sure that makes it difficult, Lawrence, from the technical side, but. So all of you are correct in that all four answers, hypotenuse wouldn't leak uh, due to more elastic tissues. There's a greater risk of rapid healing. You may require more suturing than you would traditionally do if you're direct connected to flat, and you may require stronger concentrations of antimetabolites. So these are all the things that the glaucoma team would need to consider in a younger patient. So I'll pass you over to Dimitri. Thank you for the question. So, yeah, so trabeculectomy in, in younger people is the same operation as in, in older people. It's just a lot less forgiving, generally. You have to be more careful about every step of the operation. And because the tissues are generally more elastic, more stretchy, you're certainly more prone to over drainage um, and wound leak as well. Um, now, in uh, Piper's case, um, we did the trabeculectomy in the left eye first, um, and the pressure afterwards was around three or four for a week or two afterwards, and um, that was affecting her vision. So, because when we went on to do the, because the um, there's less visual field loss in the right eye, we decided to do a presaflow operation in the right eye. Um, at the same time as doing the presaflow in the right eye and the general anaesthetic, we reopened the conjunctival pyrectomy, re-sutured um, extra sutures, although we were aware that that was a risk, obviously, before um, doing the surgery. So I did do more um, uh, uh, releasable sutures of, of the flap than I would normally do, um, typically, and I made sure that it appeared that there was minimal flow at the end of the operation, and yet still afterwards there was more flow than I was anticipating. So I then went back when we did the uh, the right eye. I opened up the left conjunctiva as well, put more sutures in, and then for the next week or two, unfortunately, Piper's pressure was up around thirty. So that did work, but it worked rather too well, um, and so we were then required to go back in and remove some of the sutures because some were releasable but even removing the releasable because i um because the pressure was so low in order in order to really um be very secure and look at the amount of flow on the table uh, sorry another thing that you can do is use an ac maintainer because that makes it easier to titrate the amount of flow through the flap and you can simulate a physiological pressure with the height of the infusion and um and work out what the flow would be at that pressure so that's what we were trying to do um but um that required quite a few sutures to achieve that extra sutures at that second operation and then the pressure went high not all of those sutures were releasable or adjustable sutures so we then did then had to open the conjunctiva again to remove some of those sutures um, and actually re-dissected under the conjunctival flap um, because there had been quite a lot of healing Unfortunately, then the pressure went the other way, which is the nature of these things in, uh, in operating on younger people. And the pressure was then low again. And for uh, the next couple of weeks, the pressure was low. Um, similarly, in the right eye, the Presaflow, which is specifically designed to only allow a certain flow rate through it, and therefore hypotony shouldn't be a major problem, was also overdraining. So, we in the right eye in the preser flow we inserted um uh, a, 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 a i'm just trying to remember what the next questions yeah, are so if you the next questions please Lawrence. just read that quickly okay so i've given away some of that already so again not a single choice uh there could be multiple answers there, are correct? I'll give you a moment to answer that and then we'll talk about what we actually did.
Okay. So most people are saying compression sutures. I think oh, the re-suturing of the flat wall, you, uh, you, no prizes for that because I've talked about doing that twice. <laughs> um, compression sutures, some of you may have spotted those uh, on the examination and um, stenting the preser flow. Uh, injection of autologous blood is not particularly in favour these days. It's a bit of an unknown quantity. You don't really know. Obviously, what you're trying to do is, is um, is induce an inflammatory reaction um, to the blood, which then causes fibrosis, but you don't want too much fibrosis and how do you titrate how much effect you have? I'd rather personally have something that where I was a bit more in control of what I was doing. Um, so yes, we did resuture and then we, um, in the right eye, we stented the preser flow. You can use a, a, a nino stent, which is a very tight fit in a press flow, it won't go all the way in. In fact, it'll only go in by a millimeter or two. Um, and you can essentially stop flow with that. So you have to be quite careful about how far in it goes. Or you can stent the entire tube with a tenno. And some people will do that routinely, particularly with people at a high risk of hypotony because they've got low aqueous production, like uh, more elderly people. Uh, some people are certainly routinely considering stenting the preser flow at the time. And I'm just going to quickly show again uh, what we did in the left eye. Back on. That's right. And look down a bit for me. So you can see hopefully there's a couple of sutures there. Brilliant. Have a sit back again. Let's put the lights back on. So, so then in the so what we did the next time when the pressure was then so it's been low, high, and now low again, is um I having opened the contract tiver. Uh, three times now, and obviously with a bit with Piper being young, there was quite a lot of of, of, of fibrosis of the tenons each time. Um, it's it's not something that you want to be doing as many you know a huge number of times if you can avoid it. So uh, for this uh, reducing the amount of flow, what we did was put um, compression sutures one over the, both over the flat, but one over the ostium. At, Le at ostium level and one further back near the posterior edge of the flap and they press down over the flap they do two things they want they physically compress it and they also induce a bit of um, inflammation which causes fibrosis and reduces the amount of flow and the press is up around the high single digits now which is really where we want it to be and her vision improved in that eye um, so that is uh, where we are in the left eye um, the only thing, uh, other thing I'd say is, is um, when you put the stent suture in the preser flow, um, it's quite helpful to actually put the end of it into the cornea, which I haven't done in the right eye, um, a bit like a releasable suture, because then if it does work too much or you get more um, fibrosis over time, you can then remove it in the same way as you can remove a, a releasable suture and then induce a bit more bit more flow. So that's where yeah, we are now. If you've been through a lot of surgery, Piper, how has it been from the diag how did you feel when the diagnosis was made of a young person being told that you have this condition? I didn't know what it was. Um so I was a bit confused about it. Um all I knew is my eyes kind of felt like they were going to explode because they were obviously quite inflated. Um and then I've never had surgery before as well, so a lot of surgery in a short amount of time. Um, and my vision got worse from it as well, which is understandable. But um, it's nice to know now what glaucoma is and what is being done to me. And I'm quite glad now it's stabilising so I don't have to go back into surgery. So how did you learn more about glaucoma? What sources of information did you find helpful? Um, so when I was going to go in for my first surgery. Um, I read about it and I watched the surgery on it so I knew what was going to happen to me. Um, and I got more interested by that um, and I couldn't really go into university and things because I was 
was quite unreliable with them, my surgeries and my appointments. So I decided to work at Specsavers because I was amazing and then I learned more about what's going on behind rather than me sitting in the machine. I can actually see what's going on and I can ask questions and everything. So it's quite handy because if I'm unsure about something, I can always ask someone and then I'll get the information. But um, I'm always explained everything here, what's happening, which is nice. Emotionally, a lot to, to deal with, really, with the pressure is going high there. How has that been? Uh... It's been okay. Um, it's nice not to feel like my eyes are going to explode. That's the main thing. Um, but it was quite noticeable when the pressures went high and low because um, the eyes were actually, um, one eye would feel a bit more kind of solid and the other eye would feel a bit more like jelly. Um, so I always, so one or the other was a bit weird and then I could tell what, what I was higher and then just by that. And what have you been told about maybe any restrictions to everyday life and activities? What advice have you been given? Well, I can start learning, well, I started learning to drive and then obviously I could for a while, so that's that pause and thing. But, so for a teen, it is quite, that's, what you want to do at that age that put a block on it um so that was quite sad because i did want to have that independence and going to the gym because i normally do weights but i can't do heavy weights now because of my eyes so again that stopped something i enjoyed um but i work around it so instead of doing like heavy weights i low weights or more, more there um so I've worked around it, it's just taking time to get used to and kind of accept. So, yeah. Thank you so much for giving up your time this afternoon. Dimitri, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Do this. The first thing we'd like to do is just put a microphone on you, if that's okay, just so that we can actually hear what you're saying, right. if that's okay with you. Yeah. There we go. Um, my name is Dr. Mamtora. We yes. spoke outside. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us this afternoon. Could you just tell us in your own words about what your experience of your eye problems have been? This one. Well, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, well, let's focus on the right eye. This one is I had the cataract. Yeah. And there was a split or something, sure. and the lens has moved. Okay. I have had some laser treatment, yeah. but it's still a bit wobbly, mm. my eye. And I think they said they would see me in a couple of months' time sure. to see what they've got. I don't think they want to operate again, mm. but I don't quite understand what they're going to do about mm. it. it. This is my bad eye, okay. and this is my good eye. Okay. So I thought they would have done my bad eye first. But I didn't. So I was very disappointed, actually. You know, well, and I'm frightened to have this one done. <laughs> well, you know, you're actually having your left eye done today, aren't yes, you? Yes, yes. Okay. And I can assure you you're in very good hands this afternoon. And we're obviously going to be taking into account what's happened in the right eye yes. and trying to maybe change our technique for the left eye to make sure that that hopefully but has an Would it be outcome. the same problem with this eye as that eye? Well, you know, sometimes when people have problems during surgery, particularly mm -hmm. cataract surgery, the reason for having that problem is due to many different reasons, but sometimes the way the eye is or the way that things are, it's more likely that the second eye can have a similar problem. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is we can learn from what has happened in the first eye yes. and maybe apply slightly different surgical techniques to your second eye surgery mm -hmm. to do our best to make sure that, that's, that what happened in the first eye doesn't happen again. Yeah. Can I ask you a, another question? Yes. That's okay. You mentioned that they've said to you that the right eye, the lens is wobbling slightly. Yeah. As a patient. It's moved. They've said it's it moved. moved. Yeah. Okay. What do you see? Well, sometimes I see sort of spots okay. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's a bit muzzy sometimes. Sure. You know, it's, I thought when I had it done, it would be perfect. Okay. <laughs> but um, there is still a bit of a cloud around there sure. sometimes. Okay. You were telling me about your experiences of having macular degeneration yeah, as well. Yes. Yeah, Tell us a bit more about that. Well, I have the injections. Okay. But every well, now I'm on every three months. So I sure. started on a month. Yeah. But on this eye, they didn't do it last time. Okay. Because I think they were waiting to the outcome. Of course. Um, 
but I don't. I have to go again in two weeks' time. Okay. Do I have to go ahead or postpone it? Well, I suppose we'll have to have a look you yeah. know, after the surgery and hopefully yes. see how it how it's going. But yeah. I think your consultant who's looking after you will have to make a decision about that one. Right. Okay. Would it be okay to have a look at your eyes? Yes. I'm just going to turn the lights off. Right. I'm going to lower the table for you as well, just yeah. so that you're hopefully nice and comfortable there. Let's just have a look. So I'm not trapping your legs at all. Can you just lean into there and then yeah. maybe bring your... Is that comfortable for you? Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Lovely. We go put my feet on the floor. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. okay. And if you want to just bring your chin onto the rest there, that's perfect. Okay. Still just there. We just back slightly for me there. Just there you go. That's it. And forehead all the way forwards now. That's it. There we go. And I hope that's coming clearly now. Okay. So let's have a look inside and see what we see. Okay. So just looking generally at your eye there, I think you know we can see that there is the lens which has moved upward slightly actually there. It's wide open as you can. Is that too bright or is that okay? Okay. okay. Hopefully that's clear for everyone on the screen that you know, we can see that the intraocular lens that's been implanted you know, is there and it's certainly covering the central visual axis. But on the dilated examination, we can see that it has moved upwards slightly. You talk about the capsule changes, you can see those. Yeah. So we can see some capsular changes. Um, let's just have a bit brighter look there. Um, can I just ask you to look down? Is it too bright? Is that too bright? <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you want to look down for me slightly there? That's it. Um, now, I don't know if it's apparent to everyone watching this, but we can actually see that you know, the capsule, maybe around five o'clock, it looks slightly discontinuous there. It kind of, it's, you can see that it's, it's run out there, okay? And that's perhaps one of the reasons, if that's, if that's quite clear, hopefully on the screen, that we can see that that's one of the reasons Especially if the if the capsular rexus during cataract surgery is around to the equator for some zonular instability and some weakness there in the way that the intraocular lens is being held, and that's responsible for the changes there. What we can actually see there here is we can see on the anterior surface of the lens is some, some what looks like giant cells there as well. Um, and we can also see what to me looks like some vitreous in the anterior chamber there. Is that apparent on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you to look straight ahead there for me? Is that okay? And then looking towards my ear, and I said that's perfect. Is that comfortable for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we should look at the cornea now because now we really have to consider what would those indications be of doing a surgery or doing something for this lady in terms of doing surgery because. You say that your vision is okay in the right eye. How would you feel if you were told that you'd have to have another surgery? What would it be? A local surgery? Local surgery. Yeah. What would you do? Take the lens out? Well, that's, one that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> Usually we do a surgery in this case if there's any evidence of that lens coming forward so much to the point where it's disturbing the cornea or perhaps even touching the cornea, which could cause you know, more serious problems, or if the lens drops back all the way completely. But in your case, I think it looks relatively stable. We've got the benefit of having a, a corneal expert in the room. Um, Omar, would you agree with, would you agree with that? Oh, I, I would agree. I think it all depends on how it looks also without the dilated pupils. It's important to know that this pupil is dilated. Uh, and of course, with the dilated pupil, she will be getting a lot of yields from the edge of the lens, the IRL. Whereas with an undilated pupil, if the edge of the eyebrow is not showing, mm -hmm. uh, and if it's reasonable, I think less is more, and probably do nothing. You mentioned to us before that you had macular degeneration. Yeah. Do you mind if we have a look at your macula as well? 
Yeah. And do a check of that too. Okay. We're actually going to put a lens on your eye there just to give a really nice view of that. But all the time, just let us know if it's too bright at all during that. And we'll see how we go. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Are you comfortable there? Yeah. Okay. So if you want to bring your forehead all the way forwards for me, so chin all the way in there for me. In fact, I'm just going to reposition your head slightly there. Okay. If you want to look up to the ceiling there for me, we're going to put a lens on the eye. Head all the way forwards there. Forward, forwards there. Looking up to you. Now looking straight ahead for me. Now looking, looking forward all the way forwards. Forward, forwards. Just come bring your forward forwards. That's it, perfect. And now I'm just going to try and bring it such that it's pushing against the bar, if that's okay. Bring the forward. That's it, that's perfect. Is that comfortable for you? Mm -hmm. And looking towards my ear on this side now. That's lovely, that's perfect. And we're just going to change here, so... Nice and steady from your day, you're doing really well. And nice and still, there you go. So first of all, we're just gonna have a look at the nerve at the back of the eye. Okay, so try and bring your forehead all the way forward to me, that's it. As far as forward, I'm just gonna lower the table side there as well, okay? Is that better? Yeah, chin down all the way, that's it. Straight ahead, that's good, okay. So hopefully that's better view, there we go. You see, we can hopefully have a view of the of the um, the back of the eye again. This is the the optic nerve, albeit slightly hazy. Okay. Um, there is some issues with the and then if we have a look there we don't yeah that's a bit clearer there isn't it is that a bit clearer mm -hmm. yeah Good. and um, just moving on to the to the macula we can see a bit of a kind of mottled appearance there of the fovea is that too is that bright or is that okay okay it's bright. That, that's bright. okay well let's not subject you to that bright light for too much longer okay i'm going to take the lens off now okay thank you very much for that let me get let me get you a tissue as well for that Just close your eyes gently for me there that's it perfect okay now you're about to have your cataract surgery on your left eye yeah do you mind if we have a look there as well yeah. so if you want to bring your forehead all the way forwards for me on the chin let's just lower that for you there get you a bit more comfortable and just bring your chin in the middle there, just there, that's it, just back slightly. There we go. And here we go. So let's have a look there. So we can clearly see this lady is phakic and she's got a very much a clear cornea. There's no evidence of any good tartar or endothelial changes there. And we've got you know, what I would describe as a a very nice two plus nuclear sclerotic cataract there with no um, sclerotic exfoliation. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for. Okay, let's sit back there. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us today about your experience. Right. And I hope everything goes perfectly with your left eye cataract surgery. So do I. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to tell to our kind of no. webinar attendees about your experience of your surgery or maybe anything that you think for, for as a no. doctor or as eye doctors that you'd like to know about your experience? All I want to know is do I still have to continue with the injections okay. for my macula? Sure. Yeah. So I still have to continue with that. I think the reality is that usually in macular degeneration, in the, in the wet form of macular yeah, degeneration, yeah. which you have, yeah. regretfully, is usually it's a long-term condition. Mm -hmm. And with yeah. the condition that you have specifically in the, what the scans show, mm -hmm. you will unfortunately need to continue with that. Right. Okay. But be rest assured that the treatments that we do give for macular mm -hmm. degeneration are very effective. Yeah. So they are helping you a lot. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I didn't want it to affect this eye if no. I was having it. So I'll, I'll continue to have the injection in this eye? 
absolutely. Next week, two weeks time. <laughs> I think you've got it scheduled for two weeks yeah, time, haven't yeah. you? So I can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Oh. Right. And our final case of the afternoon. Uh, my patient Ian has very kindly given up some of his afternoon to be with us. There's going to be a number of interactive questions here. Uh, and I want you at the end of the next couple of minutes to be able to get the right answer for the diagnosis based purely on the history. One of the problems with modern ophthalmology and modern medicine in general is people leap straight to the tech rather than taking their time and taking a history because the history, if it doesn't give you the diagnosis, will certainly give you a differential diagnosis. Um, in your double vision began back in 2017. Yep, around about um, that, yeah. Can you just tell me at that time what you started to notice about your vision? Um, I really started to notice things towards the end of the working day when I was heading home. Um, I used to cycle a lot. And uh, when I was looking at that upper left hand quadrant, started to actually have difficulty seeing things up there, such as car doors being opened and stuff like that. So I started to get a bit nervous and um, okay. things uh, deteriorated a little bit from there, but also noticed when reading presentations or anything like that, most normally when my eyes were tired, but also it was particular fields of vision that stood and out. Were things slipping horizontally or vertically? Um, or both? Actually, a little bit of both. There was the overlap between, um, mm -hmm. but... Um, it, it noted I noted it very quite significantly during the day yeah. um, and I was starting to um, find various ways of correcting my vision. So how did you correct your vision? What did you do to try and correct the double vision? Um, most of it was subconscious. Yeah. Uh, the head tilt. Yeah. So um, what, which way did you tilt your head? Uh, typically over to the left hand okay. side. Yeah. Um, a few colleagues in the office started noticing me doing it and commenting. Yeah. Uh, but at that stage I, I was still uncertain does it exactly yeah. what it was are we getting much double vision when you look to the right or was it mainly just when you were looking to the left much more so when i'm looking to the left yeah and what was it like going down stairs or or steps um it depends on um how much i'm, I'm looking uh, and what's giving direction yeah. um but um I have to change the focus uh, and the angle I'm looking at to make yeah. it uh, better, but it's um, okay. it's certainly worse nowadays when I'm going down steps. Okay, but uh, upstairs now is the worst. Okay, so Lawrence, could we have the first uh, question, please? So from that history, you should be able to tell me exactly what the problem is. So this history of a gradual onset of vertical stroke oblique diplopia. Worse in left gaze, up in left gaze in particular, a little bit in down gaze, fine in right gaze, and compensated for with a head tilt to the left. There's only really one thing that can be. We'll just give you a moment or two. And let's just have a look at the scores here. Okay, so good to see that 45% of people have got the correct answer. Uh, this is most likely to be a right superior bleak palsy just from the history alone. And because of its gradual onset rather than a sudden onset, the lack of any microvascular risk factors, diabetes, smoking, hypertension, uh, the lack of any history of trauma, trauma being probably the most common acquired cause of an isolated fourth nerve palsy uh, and also in has got a large prism vertical prism fusional range uh, it's highly likely this is a long-standing problem that has decompensated rather than uh, an acute uh, problem so what we're going to do now is just uh, look at the eye movements to see if we can confirm our clinical suspicion that this is a right superior oblique uh, palsy, and we'll be doing a little prism cover test for that. But we'll start off just looking at Ian's eye movements. So now it's going to be the video maestro here. So I'm just going to turn it this way again. Okay. So Ian's now, he's got a little subconch hemorrhage, which looks better than it did when I saw you a week ago. So if you're looking right at the tip of the pen, you can see there was a left hypotropia. So that left eye came up to take up fixation. 
and he goes back to preferring to use his right eye. So he's got right over left in the primary position. Well, interestingly, if you tilt your head to the left, height is still there, not as much as it was. So this could be due to, in theory, a weakness of the right superior oblique. It could be due to uh, a weakness of the right inferior rectus, or it could be due to a weakness of the elevators of the left eye, the superior rectus, or the inferior oblique. So if we go across into right gaze, does that go into a single pen? Yeah. So now there's no diplopia and no vertical deviation, small exophoria. So we know it can't be due to the inferior rectus here or the inferior oblique there. It must be due to either, you can see here, the huge difference in height. Just going to swap my hands. Sorry, cover. So that height, massively different in left gaze with that big inferior oblique overaction. So it could still, in theory, be a superior oblique weakness, or much less commonly, a weakness of the superior rectus. So if you do the head tilt test, if you tilt your head, your ear to your right shoulder. and I've measured this in the clinic with prism cover test. And then if you tilt it the other way, the way you like to tilt things. So the height is much less marked when he tilts this head to the right. So why is it worse when you tilt your head to the side of the palsy? If you tilt a little bit more for me, just a bit over. Because when you tilt your head like this, the right eye is having to encyclotort the in cyclotorting muscles are the superior oblique and the superior rectus. And they normally cancel each other out to keep the eye in the same vertical plane. The superior oblique is not working. The only muscle in torting the eye is the superior rectus. And that's what makes that height even worse. So that's the third part of the Parks three step test. Um, and in an isolated superior oblique palsy, it's a very accurate way of determining the paretic muscle. But you already knew all of that from the history alone. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're now uh, going to talk a little bit about how we're going to manage this. Because as active man, working, driving is an issue, uh, recreational hobbies, you already said you weren't able to, you're not able to ride your bike yeah. uh, because of this. So if we go, Lawrence, please, to the, the third question for case four just to see what the surgical options are uh, for this isolated superior oblique palsy. So give you all a moment to... So the main problem is primary position and then left gaze and up and to the left. And the answers, that was the peak. So 37% have got the correct answer, in my opinion, which is a right inferior oblique recession. So inferior oblique surgery uh, or antrization, either of the two will, will work very nicely. I tend, to, in a very large hypertropia, to do an anteriorization of the inferior oblique because it's a more powerful version of the recession. And that will correct the 15 diopters of hypertropia that Ian has in the primary position. He's got six degrees of excyclotorsion, so not a huge amount. It should address that and should address the principal problem of that big upshoot in left gaze. So primary position and in left gaze and looking up to the left should be cured by that 10 minute procedure, which if done correctly is a very safe and reliable operation. About 20% of uh, people, especially those with a traumatic acquired etiology, require further surgery because of persistent problems in down gaze and persistent excyclotorsion. And in that 
in those cases, you would reevaluate, measure in nine positions of gaze, look at the degree of torsion, and decide whether superior oblique surgery, be it a tuck if there's persistent height and excited torsion, or just a Harado Ito if there's only excited torsion, would be the second step of the operation. And this is something Ian and I have discussed in, in clinic uh, last week. Uh, we're going for the inferior oblique to start with, with a slim chance that further surgery might be required. But the take-home messages from this case are take the history before picking up your occluder and going to examine the eye movements, and then you'll know the signs you should be looking for. And hopefully that demonstration of Park's three-step test will just refresh your memories on how to evaluate somebody with a superior oblique palsy. Yeah, thank you once again for your time. I think we're Happy just help. coming to the end uh, of the webinar, just about on time. So hopefully you've enjoyed those uh, corneal cases, that interesting case of lens subluxation after surgery complicated by, uh, looks like a posterior capsule uh, rupture and zonular uh, changes. Uh, and the very interesting young woman with juvenile onset open angle glaucoma and the dilemmas faced by the glaucoma team trying to control her fluctuating pressures and to hear Piper's thoughts on what it was like to, to go through all those procedures. And it sounds like she's been managed brilliantly, not only clinically by the team in Bristol, but also in honor of emotional journey uh, with this uh, condition. I'd like to finish by thanking uh, Sunil and Mantora for all his technical expertise in setting up uh, the webinar. Hopefully you got a nice clear view of what we were seeing on the Hag Strike Slit lamp, and we'd like to thank Hagstrite for their uh, sponsorship of this uh, webinar. If you'd like to see more live webinars of uh, this nature, or if you have cases you'd be interested in seeing, please contact CyberSight because we're keen to repeat uh, the webinar if you've deemed it to be a success. So thank you once again for joining us, and thank you very much to Lawrence and Adam and Alan and the team at CyberSight. And it's goodbye from us here in Bristol. Thank you.